was to allow the wheel to slip so that you could translate in other directions. Uh, other common uses of this is like a Kiwi drive where you have three <coughs> wheels. And then this is also a newer, kind of a newer type of Omni drive uh, called a slide drive where you have basically have a squat four wheel robot and you have one, one Omni wheel that's perpendicular and then by you can drive this as a stationary four wheel robot but when you need to move side to side or translate bringing in the fifth wheel will allow you any direction of movement. Um, this is really popular when you don't want to build a custom chassis for mounting your wheels at 90 degrees to each other um, so it's just another option. And I think I have a, actually, while I go back, let me show you guys a video. I, uh, I had this kind of queued up. Um, I forgot about these. So this is the Vex Swerve <laughs> drive box. And you can see um, each one of the modules itself will rotate about itself. So instead of the actual platform turning, the individual modules spin. And that allows for some really neat movement like spinning within itself and going any direction. So I'm going to remember to grab the video. I lose my spot by clicking that link. Okay. And then the the next one is a video of the Omni Drive. I'm going to pop that out. Okay. This one's got sweet music. <laughs> so you can see it's kind of strafing in any direction. I apologize, I'm not the videographer on this one. Um, but it'll move in any direction based on combining the directions of it. And I actually I had that robot here, or one like it here, not long ago. I just didn't operate it today. And then, let's see. Going back into this. Okay. Um, so, Craig, the, yeah. the, the, uh, the, squirt, the wheels on the squirt drive, yes. uh, they, they don't have little extra rollers on them, do they? No, no. The swerve drive is just a regular fixed wheel, high traction wheel. <coughs> the frame itself rotates about it. So think of it like a like a swivel caster yeah. that you can drive and control its direction. Um, I've actually seen swivel casters adapted to those because they have the nice frames with bearings to support them as a cheap way to do it. Um, so this is the, the what, what I kind of say the, the high end of, of omnidirectional at this moment is is a McKenna wheel. It's a um, it got famous because a forklift company, uh, Air Tracks, started to use them, and now they're being produced by um, robot companies for use. And a McKenum wheel is a wheel that's similar to an Omni wheel, except that the rollers are no longer at um, no longer perpendicular to the direction of travel. They're actually at 45 degrees. So, whereas on an Omni drive, your wheels would be 90 degrees to each other, you basically are taking that angle, turning it into a roller, and putting it on a wheel. And the other thing about it is that the wheel is perfectly round when you look at it straight on. So in the straight direction, it, it functions like a normal drivetrain, but you use the same type of movement where you're alternating the direction of the wheels to move directions. So in this example, where you're seeing a McCann drive, um, each one of the wheels has its own motor, so it's individually controlled. So if you wanted to move in the direction towards the board, these two rollers would move towards each other as well as the ones on each other. So the two wheels will turn opposite to each other to move this way. They'll all move in the same direction to go that way. They'll move outward to move this way and then backwards to move down. So it's, and this is 100% based on the wheel. Um, the, the wheel actually has the ability to do this and there are lots of companies that sell these online. Uh, I actually have a really, I have a video of this one also. This will be, this will, this will explain a little bit better than I'm sure I did about how these work. So you see them just going front and back, all the wheels are moving the same direction. Now the wheels are moving opposite to each other to move side to side. It's weird. 
So by using a combination of these movements of these wheels, you can actually move in any direction. Um, So, talking about gearing a little bit, which is um, it's basically changing <coughs> changing the speed and torque of your system. Um, as as many people know, especially you guys who've, who've hacked robots together, um, you get little motors that spin 20,000 RPM. It's really hard to couple <coughs> them to a drive system to to do anything with. Um, but it's gearing when it comes down to it is just a relationship of diameters. A driver gear and a following gear with different different speeds. And the relationship difference between the two gears gives you a speed reduction or a speed increase based on the way your reduction goes. And there are so many types of gears and ways to move your move your power to your wheel. These are just going to be a couple of them. Um, give you a couple definitions first. Um, Torque is the ability to exert a rotational effort, and then in this case, it's the ability to make a wheel turn. Your motor has the ability to turn a wheel. You just have to get it into the right portion of its power curve to actually make functional torque to do what your application is. And so torque really determines if you can get the job done or not. And then the, the second part of this is power. And power is basically the rate. So it brings time into the consideration. And it, it determines how fast you can get things done. So it's the difference between just getting your robot to slightly move or gear it down even further to get it to move nice and smoothly or really fast. And so different ways to transmit that, I'm messing my slides here. So um, speed is basically your, your motor's free speed times your gear ratio. So if you get a motor that's 20,000 RPM and you want your wheel to be 1,000 RPM, you need a 20 to 1 gear ratio. Um, Torque is the stall torque time divided by the gear ratio. So at the the torque that your motor cannot spin anymore, divided by your gear ratio divided by 20, that's going to be your torque. So speed and torque are inversely proportional. The faster you go, the less torque you have. The slower you go, the more torque you have. And they're they're directly related to to each other. Stall torque is at both the rate of speed and then what's applied to the stalls. Yes, exactly. Well, st stall torque is typically a, I'll say yes in most cases. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of where it gets fuzzy because if you have the spec sheet for the motor you're trying to use, stall torque will be a provided data point. If you don't, then figuring it out becomes a not straight forward thing. Now, I have, I have a Example of a motor curve a little bit later in the presentation that I'll, I'll kind of go through and show you guys the finer points. And there are some tricks to figure out where you are just by having the motor, you know, trying to figure out what your free speed is and trying to figure out, you know, what your stall torque is. Um, but types of gearing, um, chain or belt, these are very common, motorcycles, robots, um, basically used a cog, cog sprocket and a chain, or in some cases a belt, a timing belt that has ribs on it. It's the same thing, but you're basically transmitting torque through the actual chain or belt. So there's no physical connection between the two besides the chain or belt, and they are extremely efficient. You're 95 to 98 percent efficient at transmitting torque with a chain or a belt. Um, the next most efficient version is spur gears. And typically, you'll have a combination of spur gears and belts and chains, depending on what you end up with. And these are also 95, 98% efficient. So the gear ratios for either one of these are very simple. It's just your, your larger diameter divided by your smaller diameter. That's your gear ratio. Multiply that by the speed of your motor, and you've got your root of what your speed is going to be. Um, same thing for gearing. It's all a relationship of diameters. Um, bevel gears um, bring in the ability to change um, motion 90 degrees. So sometimes you don't want to mount a motor straight out in the middle of your robot, you know, and have its and have its axis the same as where your wheels are. You need to move the motion 90 degrees for space reasons 
or other concerns. So what bevel gears essentially are, are spur gears that have been um, chamfered and made to mesh. And so similar, the exact same way to calculate your gear ratio, um, this that I'm showing here is actually a one-to-one -one gear ratio. So for every one revolution this axle spins, this axle spins in one revolution also. It just happens to change it. Now the problem is you lose a little bit of efficiency when you do this. Um, many books say 90 to 95 percent. Um, I've actually, my experience tells me it's way less um, than that, um, simply because of mechanical systems. Uh, it's really hard to line up. Well, let's step back. When you're doing a gear training, the center to center distance of the gear is really important. Now, that's actually fairly easy to, to, to measure and to make because it's in the same plane. Now, when you're dealing with an axle here and an axle here, it's pretty hard to, to get them exactly where you want it. And offsets in those distances will cause inefficiency losses. Now, that may be a little more than you need to know, but basically it's gear ratio calculated the exact same way for relationship of diameters. The other very common one is a, is a worm gear, and worm gears are great for providing an extreme reduction um, all at once. You know, whereas a 20 to 1 spur gear would be, you know, whatever your first gear is, a factor bigger to get 20 to 1, or multiple stage gearbox. Whereas a worm gear, um, basically teeth on the worm gear divided by threads on the worm, Essentially, what that means is there are, there are multi-pitch worms, um, but they're not very common. And the easiest way to calculate a worm ratio is whatever number of teeth are on your mating worm gear, that's pretty much your reduction, unless you know you have a multi-threaded worm. So this is 1 to whatever. So you can get 1 to 20, 1 to 30, 1 to 40. Now, part of a factor of, of getting down that quickly in speed is you lose that efficiency rate. 40 to 70%. Um, the other issues that you have with worm gear specifically is while in some gear trains you may have a coast feature, you know, you stop and your robot rolls a little bit, a worm gear will stop the second that you, the second you stop applying power to it. Um, uh, they also don't back drive. Uh, so one of the reasons that people use worm gears for arms and manipulators is the fact that wherever you stop your arm, your arm will stop there. And that puts a lot of pressure on your gear train. It's not exactly the recommended way to do it, but it is a practical application of a worm gear. But similar, basically, they're used to create 90 degree motion, similar to the bevel gears, and get extreme reductions in a really small space. Um, remember, everything's always a trade-off between speed, torque, and always space. So you need to get your motor that's going 20,000 RPM down to a usable speed but you only got whatever size robot you have. So sometimes you have to use something that's a little bit less efficient to get it where you need it to be. Uh, and then the last one in, in this gearing is a planetary gearbox. And these are fantastic from the perspective of being very compact. I'm sure everybody in here has used a planetary gearbox in one way or the other. Um, this is what's in every power drill. Um, your car is a planetary gearbox. Um, Basically, this uses a relationship between the sun, the sun gear, which would be the input, the planet gear, which translates the torque from the planet, from the sun outwards, and then the ring gear, which is actually a fixed column. Now, in many cases, you're, and then your ring gear is coupled to your output shaft. So, you essentially are spinning the inner, and in this small space, you get two sets of reductions. And these are really great. Um, building them from scratch is much more difficult than building a chain drive or building a spur gearbox, but there are many commercially available planetary gearboxes that you can easily modify for robots. And I've been doing ripping DeWalt drills apart and using their transmissions for a long time. Because um, they're, they're beefy transmissions and they're not going to break on you. Um, they just require a little bit of work. So the, the real debate on if you want to use one of these systems for your your robot is either you go buy a planetary transmission from someone like Bainbots or someone like Andy Mark that builds them directly that couple right to robotic motors, or you go the other side of things and you go buy a, a drill and whatever motor and you do the work to couple 